in a way that would no longer be possible with the subsequent hardening of communism and nationalism, which made these radical eclectic bricolage impossible or much more difficult. Well, the 19th century really was a century of anti-imperialist and anti-colonial struggles. Some of these movements were nationalist, some of them were pan-nationalist, some of them were regionalist, like pan-Balkanist, pan-Africanist, pan-Asianist, and so forth. Uh, anarchism intersected with all of these movements. Enrico Malatesta, as it's well known, fought in 1882 in Egypt against the British. His friend Stepniak, one, another of my favorite heroes from the 19th century, fought in Bosnia in 1878. After that, he went to assassinate the Russian minister of the police in the middle of the streets of Moscow. After that, he joined Malatesta in liberating the first villages in Italy and creating autonomous provinces in Italy. After that, he went to London and he was hit by a train. Remarkable fellow. Uh, uh, Malatesta, on the other hand, tried to swim the river Duna in Belgrade and tried to get into Belgrade, but he couldn't. He was arrested. Uh, Davide Turcato wrote a beautiful biography of Malatesta where he examines all these ideas and all of these beautiful, beautiful traditions. Uh, La Revolte, famous French magazine in 1885, I think it was founded by Jean Gard, published a letter in 1907 that chronicles the experiences of anarchist sailors who said, how can thinking and lamenting on the fate of the Algerian people, how can French people actually really believe, and this is a quote, that they have a superior civilization over the civilization of the Arabs. Zuri, an anarchist living in Tunisia, wrote in the same year that there is nothing more repugnant than the miserable European colonialism. This was the mindset of the anarchists of the day, and anarchism as a movement of migration, because you have to remember, this was a period where anarchists were involved in something that got a really bad press later on called Propaganda by the Deed, the idea of political assassination. Uh, it was a movement of migration, and anarchists were to be found everywhere. They created this tremendous universal network between different militants, between different periodicals. There were periodicals that were published in Belgrade, in Beirut, in Cairo, in Alexandria, in Montevideo, in Buenos Aires, in Paris, everywhere. Uh, Malatesta was discussed by, or read aloud by, uh, Cuban cigar rollers, people who were rolling cigars, at the same time that he was translated into Ottoman Turkish and discussed in Brazil. It was a tremendous, <laughs> tremendous force of anarchist propaganda. Now the question of course is what is that made anarchism so acceptable and so interesting uh, in this period? And I think it has to do something with anarchist profound anti-ideological nature. There was a guy, David Week, that some of you might know, the older anarchists, who wrote long before anybody had thought of the term postmodernism, anarchism has always been anti-ideological. Anarchists have always insisted on the priority of life and action to theory and system. Subjection to a theory implies in practice subjection to an authority, a party, which interprets the theory authoritatively, and this subjection must fatally undermine the intention of creating a society without central political authority. Thus, no anarchist writings are authoritative or definitive in the sense that Marx's writings have been regarded by his followers. Anarchism, because it was tradition of people on the move, tradition of people in the underground, was extremely flexible and it allowed for selective adaptations from the repertoire, very broad repertoire of anarchist ideas. Second, anarchists were not focused exclusively on spreading propaganda among the urban industrial working class. They went to the peasants, they talked to the artisans and to the artists. They created this universe of propaganda that even Gramsci in 1920 praised, saying that no movement before that spread with such success propaganda among peasants like the anarchists did. Enrico Malatesta and many other unnamed anarchists in Italy and in Spain went all over Italy and Spain, participating in peasant revolts, occupying the peasant land, destroying the land records. This had a deep resonance all over the world, and especially in the global south. Many of the people from the Global South networks came to Europe to learn how to make explosives. There was a group in the 1900s called, very kindly by British, Gentlemanly Terrorists from India, 
who uh, combine in a very ingenious, I think, fashion, anarchist ideas with their own local indigenous form of religious practice and physical training. After that, we have Gadan movement in 1907 that created this incredible link between people in San Francisco, people all over India and diaspora, and also militant peasants. It was a hybrid radical movement that was grounded in Bengali tradition of Kropotkinism but had very extensive relationships with Irish revolutionaries and Egyptian revolutionaries, and especially networks of Russian anarchists all over the world, but especially the so-called global cities of the time, like, for example, Paris, London, New York, Cairo, Istanbul, Alexandria. And uh, this is where Lee Shizeng, one of the most important people in the history of Chinese anarchism, met Elisa Klee who was the, one of the favorite anarchists of the time, not only in the Mediterranean, but all over the world, anarchist geographer, mostly forgotten today, who uh, introduced Lee Shizeng to anarchism, and Lee Shizeng founded something that was called World Society. And World Society, for the longest time, was a very important network that created this bridge of militancy between Chinese anarchists, Japanese anarchists, Chinese, Japanese, and French anarchists. Japanese anarchism, a very important site for it, was San Francisco. Many of them were actually taken to exile. And in San Francisco, in, uh, where I live today, so I love to walk around and examine all of these places, they had all these meetings, and really Japanese anarcho-syndicalist movement was founded there. It's a beautiful connection. It's really, really interesting. So uh, another thing that was very important for anarchism at that time was that anarchists displayed an incredible ability, brilliance, in using new popular media like periodicals, new spaces, and new public spaces like cafeterias, taverns, uh, shadow theater, uh, theater itself, there were what was called performing prosecution. Francisco Ferrer, after he was killed by the Spanish state in 1909, Francisco Ferrer Affair was one of the main moments, key episodes, of the global radicals of the 19th century, early 20th, early 20th century. After he was killed, there was a Francisco Ferrer play that was premiered for the first time in Beirut in 1909. Only then Buenos Aires, only then in Paris. It's pretty incredible. Anarchists created also uh, a world of literature. I mean, they were reading incredible, uh, they were reading Moliere, they were reading <coughs> Dumas, they were reading Anatole France. Yiddish anarchist papers in East and in London were publishing all kinds of masterpieces trying to make that understandable to the people. Uh, where I come from, in Macedonia, there were libraries, there were free reading rooms, there were all kinds of institutions where people were teaching on great masterpieces, but also on the, the Ninth Symphony. In Spain, uh, education was of particular significance. They created a completely independent, informal system of education. Well, Revista Blanca, the famous periodical at that time, was read aloud because anarchists, unlike Marxists later on, liked to use a very simple language because the idea was to animate the people, to make themselves understandable. Many people in this period were illiterate, so these magazines were read aloud. Uh, in Cuba, according to the Vida Ortiz, uh, theater was used for the purposes of education, mostly uh, for education of women. This is late. 19th century. Of course, there are many wonderful examples that most of you know, like modern school, well, Francisco Ferrer, that existed in, New in the Balkans, in the New York, in Beirut and Alexandria, and many other places. Popular universities that were founded in Paris by anarcho syndicalist movement in 1898. The first one moved to Alexandria in 1901. And finally, Tolstoy, Yasna Koryana. People don't like to say that Tolstoy was an anarchist. I'm not really sure why. That was a very popular school back in the day, and I think still is one of the most fascinating approaches, I think very important for us today, to education. Anarchists believe, as Herbert Reed will formulate this many, many, many decades later, that the real social transformation, the real work of revolution, begins not in the factory, but in the classroom, in a liberated school. And I think that's a great idea. The second important institution was the Mutual Aid Society. Mutual Aid Societies was the most popular immigrant society in the 19th century. Uh, it was so popular that you can find it everywhere, from South America to Japan. And Mutual Aid, in that sense, was a fairly non-revolutionary organization. 
It's a mutual savings fund, basically, that is used to help workers, to assist workers in need, to help them build cooperatives, industrial or agricultural cooperatives. But again, anarchists were absolutely brilliant in the way of using this, radicalizing this, and transforming this basis. And it's no wonder that Peter Piotr Kropotkin, his famous book on mutual aid, was one of the most popular radical readings in the global south of the period. Uh, so we have this, and finally, I think, there was a whole system of popular culture that was created that tied together key episodes and key protagonists, and that crisscrossed them all. Uh, Francisco Ferreira, then the heroism of Rabachon was celebrated. Um, Maybe which celebrates the memory not of Marxists, but of immigrant anarchists executed by the state in 1886 here in the United States. Paris Commune, of course, another key episode of the time, which was for the longest, in the 19th century, it was associated with the anarchists. Only later on, after Stalin or Lenin, it became somehow contaminated by Marxism, Marxist reading. And this, again, I think we can see that there is emergence in what I call the first anarchist moment of a global set of concerns, where radical concerns, where anarchism occupied a central place. Benedict Anderson, again, reminds us that anarchist tradition was the dominant element in the self-consciously internationalist radical left, the main vehicle of global opposition to industrial capitalism, autocracy, manifoldism, and imperialism. Even Eric Hobsbawm, who is a vicious, vicious anti-anarchist, who can barely contain his, his anger towards anarchists, who wrote that idiotic book called Primitive Rebels, a wonderful historian. But when he starts talking about anarchism, you can see the power of the ideology, of the sectarianism. He even was forced to say that in 1917, the revolutionary movement was predominantly anarcho-syndicalist. Between Marx's death and Lenin's sudden rise to power in 1917, orthodox Marxism was in the minority as far as leftist opposition to capitalism and imperialism was concerned, successful mainly in the more advanced industrial and Protestant states of Western Central Europe, and generally pacific in its political positions. And really, if you start reading, seeing what people read back in those days, there is a conspicuous absence of Marx. Jose Rizal, when he returned from prison in uh, Spain to his native Philippines, anarchist and nationalist, he, his library included, uh, included, all, included all kinds of amazing books. Uh, Anatole France, Dumas, Molière, Kropotsky, Reckley, many others, no Marx. People read Marx. People knew that he existed. He was translated to Armenia, the Communist Manifesto, but they didn't find him particularly significant. That started to change only during the beginning, and I'll try to do this really fast, I'm not really sure how, uh, only really with uh, what I would call the liberal Marxist century that begins, so liberal Marxist moment that begins in 1917. And this moment is, you know, Marxism and liberalism are profoundly Eurocentric properties. They were developed in the time when the scientific scientist ideology was, you know, uh, viciously 